In this webinar with the title Launching Data Site Global Access Program in Asia, Improving Equity, Access, and the Bid Adoption, we are going to uh, cover the following points. So this is the agenda and the speakers for today. I'm going to start with an introduction to data site and our global access program. Then we'll have Prof. Uh, Muhammad Pasha, the governing board chair for the International Science, Technology, and Innovation Center South to South Collaboration, part of UNESCO, who's joining us from Malaysia. And he's going to talk about fostering bid adoption and open research regulation. Then after that, we'll have Yuen Rawati, the Institutional Repositories Lead at Nyang Technological University, who is joining us from Singapore, and she is going to talk about the value of persistent identifiers, the case study of integrating NTU research data repository. And then we will have, last but not least, Dr. Dasatpa Erwin from Badong Institute of Technology, and he is also the co-founder of Indonesia Archive, the first preprint server in Indonesia, who is going to talk about the importance of bids for researchers and institutions as well. So yeah, let's start the webinar. So first of all, this is an introduction to data site who we are. So we are a global community that shares a common interest. Our goal is to ensure that research outputs and the resources are openly available and connected so that reuse can advance. It can be reused to advance knowledge across and between different disciplines and the subject areas, and also in different times like now and in the future. So as a community, as a data, data site community, we make research more effective with metadata that connects research and outputs and resources from samples and images to data sets and the preprints. We also enable the creation and management of persistent identifiers, provide integrated services to improve research workflow, and overall we facilitate the discoverability and the reuse of research outputs and the resources. As an organization, we are committed to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, which means that we are community governed, driven and sustainable organization. We believe in open metadata and open source application. We also help in enabling the recognition for a wide range of research outputs and resources. We also help in building transparent and trusted research infrastructure. We also encourage and participate in collaboration across the research ecosystem. So this is a snapshot from our community at data site. So we have around 2,900 institutional repositories connecting with us and using our infrastructure to register DOIs for their research output and resources. We have 280 members from 51 countries. And so far we have registered 49 million DOIs. And overall we work with around 1,300 research organizations around the globe. In terms of our strategic initiatives and the project, so in line with our mission and vision, we take an active part and participate and lead, in some cases, various community initiatives through collaboration with the stakeholders in the community with the aim to make open science a reality. So we are collaborating in different aspects. So for example, in the data matrix front, we are helping uh, the adoption and the implementation of res responsible data matrix by leading the Make a Data Account initiative. In the front of identifier registry, we support community-led registries and of identifiers such as Research Organization Registry or ROR-ID. In terms of repository discovery, we contribute as an organization to, te to the development of repository discovery initiative, such as the RE3 Re data project. And one of our important initiatives and the project is the global access program that I'm going to highlight in my presentation. But before we go to the global access program, let me give you a quick introduction about persistent identifier. So what is a persistent identifier or a bid? So a bid is usually a unique alphanumerical string referring to a digital resource. The digital resource will have a landing page with a metadata representation. So there are three different types of bids. There are bids that can be assigned for object, such as research outputs and the resources. And we have here the most famous example is the digital object identifier or the DOI. 
And there are bids that can be assigned for people like academic researchers and the contributors. And we have here ORCID ID. And we have also bids that can be assigned for organization or places such as research organization, university centers, and we have here the ROR ID. So this is an example for a bid or ORCID ID for an academic researcher from University of Philippines. So within his ORCID record, he can add his current affiliations. He can also add all his publication and the contribution to the research community. This is another example for bid that can be assigned for places. So we have ROR ID that can be assigned for research organization. And here we have the example of University of Malaya in Malaysia. And then we have digital object identifiers or DOIs. So data site DOIs are suitable for a wide range of research output. To put things into context, we have two main categories. The first one is the research data sets, collections, associated workflows, software, images, samples, models, protocols. And then we have a second uh, layer so that data side DOIs can also support, which we call gray literature, such as thesis, dissertation, reports, uh, newsletters, unpublished conference paper, which are usually stored inside an institutional repository. So I brought some screenshots and examples from data site community so we can all have an idea about uh, that. So this is an example from the National Research Council of Thailand who is an active data site member and they have their own research, national research repository. And this is an example for a data set and they are using uh, DOIs aligned with the data sets. This is another example from the National University of Singapore for a report that is published a year in review, and they are including also a DOI for that. This is another example also for the use of DOI for text uh, materials from the national, uh, from the China National Gene Bank. And we have also another example for a software tool that has been produced during a research process, and it has been shared with a DOI with the community. We have also another interesting example here for how DOIs can support thesis and dissertation for this doctoral thesis, for example. Another example also for DOIs that is used for figures and images. So for example, this research, uh, these researchers published the, the model of ECG model mapping and they assigned a DOI for their figure or their image. So at the end, so as we can see, we saw the example of DOI supporting various research outputs from samples and images to data sets and preprints. So why, what, what is the value? So first of all, the value for the academic researcher themselves, assigning DOIs to these outputs are really making their work more discoverable, will help you in making your research outputs more accessible. That can lead to more citation, more reusability as well for your content. So using DOIs or assigning DOIs for all the research outputs that you are as a researcher uh, is producing is very, very valuable. And it's also very, very valuable for your institutions because when you get more citations, this will bring benefits also will add value and benefits to your research organization. This is a snapshot from the work types that have, regist have been registered through data site. So we have around 14.8 million data sets, 4 million images, 1 million preprint, 12 million physical object, uh, around 1 million collections. So as you can see, we have an active wide range of resource research outputs and the resources that have used digital object identifiers or DOIs. Then in terms of our uh, core initiative that I'm going to highlight today is our global access uh, program. So we launched the program this year in February 2023 through a grant or a funding that we received from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Our aim is to increase the global adoption of persistent identifier and improve also the equity and the access to our bid uh, infrastructure, especially in the underrepresented uh, regions. So data site has taken a comprehensive approach with our global access program and increasing the global adoption. I'm going to highlight that later in my slides. 
So this is a, a, a snapshot for GAP team. So I got hired under the program and we have my colleague Gabriella Mihas is leading the team. I have my colleague Busun who's managing and leading data site activities in Africa. My colleague Arturo is also leading data site activities in Latin America. So what are the challenges that we are currently facing for increasing the global adoption of BID? So the majority of our membership are mainly coming from Europe and North America. We do have members also from GAP regions, but we want to increase the adoption within this region. There are a lack of underlying infrastructures in many countries. There are also low awareness levels between the researchers, the policy makers, the, institu the research institution themselves about the value of adopting resistant identifiers. And for sure there are financial barriers in some countries. So data site has taken a comprehensive approach with the global uh, access program through three components. The first one is outreach, the second one is technical infrastructure, and the third component is a funding component. Within the outreach uh, component, we are currently analyzing the needs and education opportunities per region. We are working on developing educational materials, best practices, and policy guidelines. We are also seeking for a collaboration with local communities. We are also finalizing the framework and will be launching a data site ambassador program to build the trusted network of volunteers among GAP regions. We are also working on providing case studies and regional examplars. So this is a snapshot from uh, our outreach activity that we have already delivered. So as you can see, we are delivering webinars in different language, Spanish and Arabic, and we are also reaching out to different uh, regions. Like in Africa, we had a fantastic collaboration with the Open Science South uh, Asia Network in, uh, in India. So we are trying to build that platform of collaborations and spread the message in different language as well with the regional uh, communities. So this is a snapshot also from our upcoming activities uh, at data site within the Asian region. So we have the international workshop on open science identifier in China this October. We are attending and presenting at the ATD conference in India. We are presenting also at the research management administration conference in Malaysia uh, this November. We are attending the Arab Federation conference in Saudi Arabia this November. And we have at the end of the year, the Japan uh, at Japan, we are hosting data site and ORCID community event December uh, at the end of this year. In terms of the second component, the infrastructure, so within that we are currently analyzing the infrastructure landscape of bid in these in our GAP regions. We're also planning to collaborate with the repository uh, platform and the service provider. We are also aiming to set up at the end user groups to benefit each other expertise and reuse, for example, the code for uh, integrations. So this is a snapshot from the, the reports for Asia. This is uh, the charts from Asia. We used standardized uh, sources, data sources like Ruar, OpenDuar, Puar, to have an idea about the number of repositories. What is the current uh, landscape for the, uh, the, uh, the number of repositories in the Asian countries right now? We are also looking with different data sources like re 3 data, BKB product to have an idea about the BKB product installations uh, within Asia. And we are also uh, trying to have an analysis about the current landscape for the service provider as well, which softwares are being used the most. These reports will be openly available, published with the community and open for sure for any comments or feedback. Within the infrastructure reports also, we are going to cover the awareness. As we know, so the current awareness level about resistant identifier from the initial work that we are currently doing are not that high. So we are tracking that through, for example, raw uh, map data, just to have an idea about the current awareness among the Asian community and overall all gap regions. The third component for our global access program is the funding. So within that, we launched a global access fund to provide financial support for outreach activities and infrastructure development in underrepresented regions within the GAP region, Latin America, Africa and Asia, and Middle East. The GAF also, or our Global Access Fund, is part of our Global Access Program, and it has been made possible through the grant that we received from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. 
So within our global access fund, we can fund outreach and engagement activities so to support increasing the awareness and adoption of global and local solutions and connect also with community activities such as capacity building events and outreach activities. And this fund is up to 10,000 euros. We have another fund also for the open infrastructure development and integration to enable the creation and the adoption of data site infrastructure. And this fund is up to 20,000 euros. We have the, the, the last element under our Global Access Fund is demonstrator. So here we are looking for organization that can make a broader impact within on a national level, on a country level, or even to the whole region. So like they can uh, provide or leverage an existing or create an open international infrastructure uh, services or facilitating indigenous uh, knowledge uh, sharing by building a bit infrastructure that supports enabling the recognition of that type uh, of knowledge. And this fund is up to 50,000 euros. So who, ca who can apply? Representative of non-profit organizations such as universities, NREN, governmental bodies within Africa, Latin America, Middle East, and Asia can for sure can apply. And also application are open to data site member and non-member as well and both new and well established organization can apply in terms of the date the call for proposals uh, for proposals have been already launched first of september the application due date is 15th of october which means that we have almost nine or ten days and we are expecting to announce the result by 15th of december and the project will run through the uh, the whole course of 2024 from jan to december this is the GAF URL to go through the, the page to have an idea about the criteria. You will find also the form to apply. Please make sure there are no second round of revision. So please make sure to provide all the completed form, the budget form, the tasks form, the timeline form, the sustainability plan form to complete and provide the completed information because this can enhance your application. So yeah, at the end, we are working with the local partners, as I highlighted, stakeholders on training on topics such as metadata, data citation. We are also working on developing new tools and workflows that can help streamline the research data life cycle. Our end goal with our global access program is to create uh, an actual more equitable and inclusive research ecosystem where all researchers, and we mean it, all researchers al around the globe and communities have the tools and the resources that they need to conduct and share their work. So yeah, so thank you so much for this. And I think I'm exceeding my time. So now I will stop uh, sharing my screen. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to post the questions in the Q&A box and we are going to answer them at the end. Now I will hand over the word to Prof. Basha from ESTIC uh, UNESCO, who's going to talk about the role of pushing the regulation for resistant identifiers. Pasha, you are on mute. If yeah. You want to, okay. And, yeah. Uh, is it okay now? Yeah, we can see your screen and we can hear you as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a moment. I would like to. All uh, right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, and also Data Site for inviting us, uh, distinguished panelists and researchers, ladies, gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of uh, ISTIC UNESCO, uh, I am honored to be part of this event to address a topic that has the potential to reshape uh, the landscape of research innovation and global collaboration, which is synonym to our role as a UNESCO category two center for South-South cooperation. So I'm not gonna deliberate uh, on this on detail. You can check our website. So in my presentation, I will delve uh, deep into this critical issue, highlighting its significance, uh, the power of PIDS or PITS uh, and the transformative potential uh, of open research regulation. Okay, and then I will uh, just discuss a bit on the global and Malaysian perspective. We know there are many challenges uh, ahead that we can discuss. And of course, there is a workshop or seminar that we can discuss in detail about it and come up with a, a brief conclusion on uh, my talk uh, today. So uh, we live in a world where information flows like never before. So where research has uh, the power to solve some of humanity's most pressing challenges. However, this immense wealth of information also brings challenges 
in terms of discoverability, transparency, and accountability. So fostering persistent identifier, as well explained by Muhammad just now, and implementing open research regulations or open research OR, yeah, are crucial components of open science initiatives. You know, uh, we are, I think in Asia, we are still quite like about the open science, even many of the researchers uh, do not still understand what is open science, what is open access, what is open research, everything is actually related. So these two aspects play a significant role in advancing the openness, transparency, and accessibility of research, uh, particularly on the scientific research. So here's my, uh, the overview of the uh, significant. First, of course, we are talking about the uh, PITS. Yeah, for example, just now the DOI the, for the object or orchids for the researcher. This one, or you know, provide a unique and a permanent, this is the most important word, it's actually permanent identifiers for research outputs, database, and so on. And second point is actually enhancing reproducibility. This is actually one of the biggest issue uh, because uh, you know, uh, researchers not just uh, share their findings, but also the underlying data, code, and methodologies. So from here, it can enhance the reproducibility of scientific studies, which is very essential element uh, of the scientific method. And of course, when we talk about this, we are, we are looking forward uh, the collaboration. Yeah. So through this, uh, it will be easier for researchers to find uh, and connect with other with each other's work, and later on, we're focusing more on the tracking the impact and reach of the research output uh, through this enabling research metrics and assessment. Uh, for example, this is actually being used in uh, bibliometrics. Uh, other than that, it is also important for uh, the stakeholders, for example, the funding agencies, institution, yeah, to make an informed decision about the value and impact of research. Uh, and for this case, yeah, uh, supporting data management and preservation, uh, this is what we are talking about, the long-term accessibility and the preservation uh, of this data set. And one of the biggest issue, the most talk about is actually on the trust and accountability. So it becomes easier to identify any potential issues, for example, like kind of a research misconduct or data manipulation. Uh, we can discuss it more later on, or maybe uh, other workshop on this part. And finally, uh, it is also related to the compliance uh, requirement, which is actually very essential for securing funding and uh, publishing research in reputable journals. And then it can drive uh, the adoption of these uh, practices. So what is this uh, PID, uh, the power of it? Let's begin by understanding what persistent identifiers are and why they are so crucial in our quest. Uh, for open research and uh, transparency. So the first one, well elaborated, yeah, about the unique digital signatures where the PITS, uh, for each piece of research, it has its own, either its publication or data set or researcher's profile. And this distinct identifier remains unchanged over time, ensuring that we can always trace and locate the research, even in a vast digital uh, ocean. And uh, second point is enhancing discoverability, meaning that it will be easier both by search engines and fellow researchers. And this also can link to uh, what you call this, to, to, to trace back, advancing its impact to the system. And uh, another very important issue that I believe is we have to make sure that uh, the citation and the attribute uh, attribution are basically the lifeblood of scholarly work. So we must ensure that the credit goes to the rightful authors and uh, contributors. And finally, will be on the uh, long-term accessibility. We know that websites keep changing. So regardless of technological evaluation or changes in digital infrastructure, so the information in PITS yeah, remain there. So these safeguards knowledge for the future generations.
Now, I'd just like to highlight more uh, on the open research regulation, which is also very important other than PID, because these provide the guidelines and the governance structure to ensure the systematic adoption uh, of open science principle, uh, mainly when we talk about the mandate of PID usage, yeah, where in this uh, open research regulation necessitate the use of PIDs for all research output. This means that every piece of research from publication to data set carries a unique digital identifier as we uh, mentioned earlier. So that can lead to uh, foster data share, uh, foster uh, data sharing can lead to or encourage researchers to share their data sets openly through PIDs. So why it is important other than accelerating the innovation, but it also allow uh, others to build upon existing research and to reduce the redundancy of work and promoting efficiency. Uh, at the same time as well, we talked about it just now, promoting collaboration, meaning that, uh, you know, this kind of open research regulations break down the disciplinary and geographical silos. So this again can drive uh, the progress of the research work at an accelerated pace. And finally, we talk about the enhanced uh, accountability. So, yeah, again, reduce the likelihood of misconduct and promoting integrity within the research community. Um, later on, I would like to give you a very brief about the global and uh, Malaysian perspective, uh, particularly for both PITS and uh, open research uh, regulation. Basically, it's no limitation, no, uh, you know, there is no, it's borderless, basically. Uh, so it is actually a good a global endeavor that transcends boundaries in a world where knowledge knows no borders. So for example, we are looking at the global research uh, equity, accelerated science progress, and later on, I'll discuss more on the Malaysian side, where we can uh, bridge the gap between the developed and developing nation. I think this is one of the big role that ISTIC UNESCO is trying to do uh, from South-South uh, or Global South and the Global North. So basically both have equal access to global body of knowledge, then uh, through this collaboration on the global scale, it also can accelerate uh, scientific progress. Yeah, we can pull our collective expertise to tackle the world's most pressing challenges. We talk a lot about the climate changes uh, to disease outbreak and many more. And one of the most important is actually we know open research is inclusive by nature. So from here, uh, you know, it's diverse background, uh, and encourage them, I mean, researchers to contribute to solving the global issue. Yeah, in Malaysia particularly, researchers can register, I'm sure that even not many Malaysians know about this, researchers, researchers can register for the researcher prof, a personal uh, identifier at online researcher information database or read uh, 2.0 which is actually maintained by the Malaysian Ministry of Economy. And this is particularly uh, PID for a person or researcher. And now we come to the challenges. While the benefits uh, of fostering PIT and open research regulation are very clear, we must acknowledge uh, the challenges. Uh, these include resistance uh, to change, concern about data security, privacy, and the need for infrastructure and education. So we do believe that this is where we need to focus more on, uh, we have to invest first in educating researchers, and we have to have uh, awareness campaign. So we have data site, for example, just now offering through their GAF. And second point is actually on the data security and privacy, yeah, where we can design or this open research regulation can be designed to protect the sensitive data. It's very important. This is one of the major concerns, ensuring that privacy and security are maintained. Yeah. And finally, that I mentioned just now, infrastructure development. So again, the government and the institution should invest in the necessary uh, uh, infrastructure. And in conclusion, we can say that uh, in, uh, in, by fostering the PID uh, adoption and advocating for open research regulation is not just a choice. I think it is an imperative and it is actually a step towards democratizing knowledge, accelerating scientific progress and addressing global challenges. So this is actually a huge opportunity for us 
to build a future where research benefits all of humanity, where collaboration knows no boundary that I mentioned earlier. And the most important is actually the pursuit of knowledge is transparent and equitable. So from here, uh, fostering PIT and uh, implementing open research regulation are essential for advancing open science initiative. Again, uh, ISTIC would like to, uh, to, to lead or uh, with other uh, initiatives like in Africa uh, and Latin America, open science initiative to, to bring it in uh, to, to uh, Asia, particularly to the Southeast Asia region. So we believe that through here, we can enhance uh, they enhance the transparency, accessibility, and reproducibility of research, promote collaboration, and strengthen the integrity of the scientific progress. And finally, I could say that as a scientific uh, scientific community, so we believe from here it can continue to embrace open science principle, PITS, and open, re open research regulation will play a central role in shaping the future of research and innovation. So finally, from my uh, for myself, yeah. As we move forward, let us be the change makers who usher in an era of open research, where the power of knowledge is harnessed for the betterment of our world. Together, we can create a future where research is open, transparent, and accessible to all. So, thank you very much. Terima kasih. I hand it over to you, Muhammad. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Pasha, and I completely, completely agree with all your uh, conclusions, the all valuable contribution to this webinar. So thank you again. Now we are going to move to Yoyen, who is going to share with us the interesting integration of uh, Nyayang Technological University and connecting their data repository with BIDS. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, let me just share my screen. I think now everybody can see my screen, yeah? All yes. right. So a very good morning, afternoon or evening uh, to everyone. And thank you, DataSite, for having me here. My name is Yu Yun. I'm from Nanyang Technological University. And for today's sessions, I'm going to do a very quick sharing about the value of persistent identifier in case of our uh, data repository. Just a little bit of background. Nanyang Technological University is quite a young university. It was established in 1991. We have about close to 35,000 student population and close to 8,000 faculty and staff. And it is a research intensive uh, university. And back in 2016, the university actually came up with a research data policy that stipulates all the researchers within NTU community, they need to manage and share their research data in a timely and responsible manner. Following this policy in 2017, the repository for research data, which we branded as DRNTU data, was launched. And it is really to cater to the NTU needs to share and archive their research data. And this platform, we are actually using an open source software called Data First, uh, and it's managed by the NTU library. Currently, we have more than 1,000 published data set in this repository. Now, let's connect this to the PID, right? Persistent identifiers. That's why we are all here. And I'm just going to highlight three use cases of persistent identifier in relation to our research data repository. The first one is very, very obvious. I think a lot of researchers, when you're submitting your paper, your manuscript to journals, and the editors or the peer reviewer will ask you, can you provide a data availability statement, right? And data availability statement is basically for the authors to tell audience, to tell the readers, where is the underlying data that they used to reach the conclusion of their papers, right? Uh, where it is located. And typically you provide the hyperlinks to the data as well, okay? I'm not quite sure whether you're still familiar with this phrase, but I still see it in today's journals, right? Data availability statement follows by this statement. Data is available from corresponding authors upon reasonable requests. <laughs> One of the researchers actually came to me and says, Yuyun, this is not data availability statement. This is data unavailability statement. <laughs> All right, so it's really a push like what Prof. Bashar said, more towards transparency and research integrity. I stumbled upon this post on Twitter. Last year, it was still called Twitter. Okay. Um, there was really a paper 
and they put in their paper, the data availability is like, data sharing is not applicable to this article as no data sets were generated or analyzed during the current study. <laughs> it's a real case and it's it's been retracted this paper. And it, it true enough that the data that they use is question mark, it's very kind of like seems fabricated, that kind of thing. So yes, if you ask me whether people pay attention to this data availability statement in the paper, yes, people do. And it might result in a questionable or doubtful conduct and it might result in retraction of paper. So yes, data availability statement is kind of like promoting the research integrity in its, its usage case. And I will give you a screenshot of which I would say a proper data availability statement in which the author actually declares the data that support the finding of the study is actually available in certain repository followed by the persistent identifier. For these two cases, it's actually a DOI link to that particular data set. So that's the first use case. Uh, let me move on to the second use case, citation. I think uh, Prof mentioned it earlier also, right? Uh, we keep on telling researchers, share your data, put your data in a repository for, you know, for the society good, for, for the benefits of all data sharing and all that. But what's in it for them, right? They want, they want to share, yes, but what's in it for them? And we tell them it increased the visibility of your research. And it also has a potential to uh, be cited and used by others. And we have to walk the talk, right? If we say that, yes, we want to share your data, but we also want to showcase to you that your data is being cited, then the usage of PID becomes very important because this is how the machine readable PID can easily extract the information that the data set has been cited elsewhere and put it here, you know, in the data set pages that yes, your data set has been cited and where it's actually being cited, right? And the third use cases, um, long lasting digital reference, that's what I put there. And when we think about repository, we think not in term of one year, two years, but we're thinking more about like 10 years, 15 years down the road, right? And some of you might be like, are we really going to change the domain, change the website? Lo and behold, actually the first year I'm managing the repository, things happen. It, it did indeed happen, you know, the, the address changes and things like that. And a lot of people suggested, okay, you can do a redirection and things like that. But persistent identifier proved to be like the easiest, most convenient and most economical way to actually manage this uh, changing of address, changing of domains and things like that. So yeah, think about it as uh, long-term solutions. And when you think about it from that angle, it's really the most uh, efficient solutions, right? So uh, bring it back to our own case in, in NTU. Um, we're using the data first software to build our repository and persistent identifiers, it's actually, a required and integral part of the software. The software itself gives us a few options uh, for persistent identifiers. Okay, so they are there's not just one solution, but they actually offer a few. So one of them is uh, DOI. Okay, they also give another way of having a persistent identifiers using handles or even a permanent link, permalinks. Right. So either of these options is actually catered for in the software, depending on how you want to activate and utilize it. For us, when we are given this kind of option, we actually have to think what is our need? Can one of these actually meeting our needs? And these are our needs and these are non-negotiable needs. Right. The first one is interoperable. OK, in a sense that we're thinking if, let's say, one day we don't use this software anymore, we're moving to a different software, can this persistent identifier be interoperable? We don't want something that just stays with the software. It has to be something that can be interoperable in other system. The second one is machine readable, OK, because we want it to be like uh, uh, automated. So we don't want kind of like something that's only human readable, but it has to be machine readable. And the last one is make data count. That means we need a mechanism to really track down the citations that is being captured in the system as well. 
Okay, so these are our three requirements. And by looking at all the possible identifiers, we ended up choosing the OI that we think can fulfill all the requirements that we need. Okay, and we ended up with DataSight as our agency to actually produce and mean the DOI, but we didn't go uh, directly, but we went into uh, DataSight membership as a consortium through the Global Data First Community Consortium. We choose this way because we thought it's the most uh, sensible, economical, and practical way for us, okay? And actually, when we kind of like jump into the data site bandwagon, we got a bonus in which we got the access to all the data site comments, not only for us, but all for all of our users. Uh, I will give you a few screenshots to illustrate what I'm trying to say. So let's say there is a researcher um, that is currently working in our university. Uh, she can actually find her own profile in the data site comments, and she can see uh, the data sets that she has been uh, producing. It's actually captured here with all the metrics, like the number of views and downloads and things like that. So eventually, if let's say she move on, no longer working in our university and move on elsewhere, all this information, all these metrics and things like that, she can always access it and it's always accessible to her. So I think that's something very useful and beneficial for research. I think that's all my sharing. Looking forward to comments and questions by the end of this uh, sessions. Back to you, Mohammed. Thank you so much for the fantastic presentation and really, really interesting uh, case study for uh, connecting with uh, with bits. So thank you again, you for this. Now we are going to hand over to Dr. Dasatta Erwin, who is going to highlight the benefits of using bids for academic researchers and their institutions as well. Okay, I will share screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Esapta. I am a lecturer in Institute Technology Bandung. My field of study is geology, focusing on hydrogeology. So I study groundwater uh, in, in my daily practice and lecturing. Uh, and because of my uh, so-called passion in open science. Uh, in 2017, I founded with some colleagues. We founded uh, in archive. It's a preprint server for Indonesia. Uh, it was a, a collaborative action with Center for Open Science, and then. That server slightly changed due to the hosting. So we uh, try to move the hosting from the Center for Open Science to Indonesian Science Institute, or it is now called the BRIN, B R I N. So the name is uh, Rebatch to RIN Archive. So you will see the writing later on, uh, RIN Archive. So RIN Archive currently hosted um, around 200 papers of preprint. Um, and it was a collaborative uh, action with the BRIN. So in this case, I, on behalf of the open science community in Indonesia, I appreciate the, the willingness of the brain to host the uh, preprint server. So coming coming to my presentation, um, actually my presentation is not in the form of a PowerPoint slide. Um, it's a blog post. You can I can write it in the chat. Um, and the blog post contains this picture. So say. 2013, I tried to learn how to draw to save my time to write things, right? So I decrease my time to write and increase my time to draw. <laughs> um, so in this case, I point out the importance of being found, right? In 
in the age of internet. So uh, the title of my talk today, a short talk actually, is In the Age of Internet, Being Found Matters Most. Um, of course, in this case, it's uh, scientific materials, right? So uh, the first two speakers have point, pointed out um, so much information and benefits of using persist persistence identifier, right? And the the most uh, common used, as Mohammed says, says, is UOI, right? So in this case, I also agree with with all three uh, presenters that uniquely identified documents will ensure persistency. So the, the document has its own number, right? Uh, imagine you have a car and the car has a license plate. So we cannot find the same uh, license plate, right? For two different uh, cars, right? So it's just like that. So with the persistency of the identifier and then lead to more discoverability and also it can be easier to 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 us to to the to the um, persistent ID publisher and then to the users of course easier to track and link between documents right so at the end at the end the the result is we can measure metrics right the traditional metrics that we know of right like uh, citations and also um number of wait i think can you still hear me yes yeah okay uh, the power of my earphone is is dead now so uh continuing my my talk here so, and then online discoverability is also, of course, increased visibility, right? Um, later on, I will talk about how uh, the, the situation in Indonesia about this, right? Uh, with the increase of visibility and the increase of accessibility of the files, of the data, of the documents, and then at the end, we can increase the dissemination to wider community, right? And then, of course, we can increase the impact. Right, and then the third one, uh, Professor Bashar have mentioned it, is that online discoverability uh, increased transparency and credibility. Right, so um, <clears throat> it's it's kind of the 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 main goals, right? Not the metric. And then, how is the situation in Indonesia? So currently. Uh, in Indonesia, as well as in other Southeast Asian countries, aside to Singapore, of course, um, <laughs> you, you know. the current science policy primarily focuses on peer-reviewed papers, right? Uh, citation metrics and other quantitative measures. However, there the, it's, it, it appears to be less emphasized on the research process process itself, right? research integrity and online discoverability. So uh, all science policy will directed to metrics in Indonesia. So, and then these aspects are crucial for fostering a thriving research environment, right? So if we put more focus on the research integrity, uh, on the process of the research itself, so we can, um, foster the the research environment, right? But in in Indonesia, policymakers may not sufficiently prioritize those those aspects. Right? Um, and then, although in Indonesia, DOI has been popular, has been known since two thousand and five, right? Uh, that was when the journal accreditation body. Um, it's a body of from the government, right? From the Ministry of Education. Uh, they they 
accredited journals, right? Um, so those guidelines mandated the use of DOI, right? But its use case was primarily for journals, the DOI. Therefore, many institutional repositories who state gray literature, gray literature, as Mohamed says, like this is in Indonesia, do not have object identifiers, right? Which leads to low discoverability, right? And then the problem is thesis, which is stored in the inter institutional repositories, uh, cover topics that mostly um, has this address local problems, right? It related to geographical, cultural, and socioeconomic aspects. So I think, and I think most of us here would think the same, that those uh, scientific products deserve the same level of discoverability, right? So they, they deserve the same of discoverability as peer-reviewed articles and journals, right? So um, then the impact can be uh, can be contributed to, especially in in a local community, right? Rather than for international community, right? Because they address local problems. So on the other hand, the last thing uh, I would say in this talk, on the other hand, commercial social media like. Research gate, for instance, they use DOI. So they are more popular to scientific community than uh, other non-commercial technologies or practices like institutional uh, repositories. Right? So I think that is uh, my talk for today. So I think the DOI or other uh, type of PID should be also concentrated for the gray literature, not only for the peer-reviewed journals. And we need to build those awareness to uh, science policy makers and also university leaders, especially in this case, my task is in, in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so Great. much, Dr. Dasapta. I completely agree with the, with you. Yeah, so DOI should be used also for gray literature such as uh, thesis uh, and dissertation. They are really, really uh, valuable for that. We have a question from Jennifer regarding, can you show us uh, an example of how DOI is used for physical objects, uh, please, if there are a way to discover uh, them online. Yeah, I think uh, we can post that uh, poll maybe uh, to from data site uh, comments. Yeah, for sure, we can we can share an example about uh, DOIs for physical objects. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have just a, a general question. So from your point of view, we are covering different communities. So uh, for example, Borof Bashar is coming from the, uh, the, 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 the regulators, the centers who can push the open science policies uh, role. So what are the actual obstacles on the ground for pushing uh, bids and adopting uh, bids? First of all, let's start with you from the regulators point of view. Well, I think at this point, uh, the usage of uh, pits and also uh, particularly like uh, orchid uh, scopus, yeah, uh, is actually like kind of a mandatory because I think most of the universities, for example, in Malaysia, uh, have uh, like kind of compulsory because for like kind of the promotion, you have to put all the informations like that. And I think most of the journals right now also using the DOI and most of the CV, they have to put the DOI as well. So I think that is a basic. But in terms of uh, when we talk about the open science or open research regulation, so that is not yet in place. Uh, I, I think under the Malaysia Open Science uh, Program, now we already start to go to uh, most of the universities. That is actually in Malaysia. But uh, when we look at the Global South, uh, there are not that many yet. But we know that there is initiative in the South uh, America, 
and of course in uh, Africa as well. But I think in Asia, we haven't seen that yet. So that's why we believe uh, we can assist uh, many, um, what you call these uh, countries in uh, Southeast Asia or in Asia, South Asia, because we know that there is massive of information, uh, particularly if we're talking about the uh, uh, under UNESCO, we're talking about the uh, indigenous local knowledge. That is actually very important for us. You know, there are many kind of research can be started from this indigenous uh, local knowledge, and it should be properly uh, kept in 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 you know uh, under this open research and also uh, through pits. I think that's yeah. uh, in the in the beginning. Yeah, we 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 need yeah. to have that kind of regulation. I think we can start with the science uh, advocacy or diplomacy prior to the policy. So I think uh, ISTI can assist to be a platform for everybody. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, completely agree for you. And the awareness, as you said, is a very, very important element in pushing these policies forward to the different stakeholders from our side as data site, uh, increasing the awareness and outreach activities, an important pillar of our global access program. And we are more than happy to collaborate with ESTEC or Malaysia Open Science Platform or any different organization across Asia. Uh, Yuyan, I have just a, a question regarding also the same uh, obstacles, but from the library the data repository managers, what are the obstacles in adopting uh, bids within their data repositories from your point of view? Mm, okay, I think like what uh, Dr. Desapta has already mentioned, um, the gray literature and trying to get the persistent identifiers from them is quite challenging in certain countries and certain institutions. And like what he mentioned, you know, we can't even compete with places like uh, preprint or research gate and things like that. So I think cost can still be a barrier. So I'm, I'm actually thrilled to be volunteering my time for this kind of thing, because I think it's really for a good global good, you know, your, your global access program so that people can give it a try, give it a go and see how it, it actually uh, improves uh, the discoverability of their research in their particular institutions. And I think for our case, we went through the consortium to get all these uh, facilities available. That's another good way of doing it, I think. Uh, so we kind of like uh, shared the resources among the consortium. So I'm looking forward to those kind of initiatives coming even more. Yeah, consortium or the GAP program, the Global Access Fund also. Yep, very good initiative, I would say. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and analyzing also the current landscapes and also the financial bar barrier that you highlighted. So we launched the Global Access Fund, enabling uh, organization to get funded through us, and then they can establish their uh, bid and create their bid uh, infrastructure. Dr. Dasatpa, you highlighted within your talk the, uh, the value of bids for researcher. Do you want to add anything before we, we finish regarding the value of bids for academic researchers and their institutions? Um, sorry, Mohammed. Can you uh say again your question? Do, do you want to add anything uh, regarding the value of bids or the obstacles of adopting bids from academic researchers' point of view? What are the obstacles yeah. that are preventing them? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so as I uh, was saying about uh gray literature, so not all research end up in peer-reviewed journals, right? That's the important situation that we have to understand, especially in, in Southeast Asia countries, uh, that um, maybe the local research is not seen to be uh, of interest to international readers. So most of them are not going to be published in international journals, for instance. So at least those uh, gray literatures can also be found as its original form as a thesis uh, and the data, of course, if those documents has the ID. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for this. Uh, with an eye on our uh, clock, so let me share my screen. So 
to share with all the attendees our upcoming uh, activities. So if you go to datasite.org slash events, you can see and track all the upcoming events, webinar that we are hosting and talking to the community. So first of, uh, uh, first of all, within 12 of October, we are hosting Datasite annual community meeting 2023. We are opening it for Datasite members and non-members as well. So even if you are not a Datasite member, you are an academic researcher, librarian, and you want to know more about Datasite, the world that we are doing our plans for the future as well feel free to just go to this page and check any event for example we are hosting a fantastic uh panel for the funders to talk about the role of bids in building a robust and trusted infrastructure for tracking uh the the, the funders uh submissions so you can also go to the page just click register and uh, join the the event yeah so datasite.org slash events for any events that you are uh, interested in uh, in joining thank you so much if you have any questions regarding data site data site membership feel free to reach uh, out to me and looking forward to connecting with uh, with all of you again yeah, I would like at the end to thank all our fantastic speakers, Dr. Dasatpa, Prof. Bashar, and uh, Ewan as well for the fantastic uh, presentation and contribution to this webinar. Thank you so much.